call. So thank you very much, Paul, for doing this webinar. I'm really interested in hearing all about patient safety. Paul is, Dr. Paul O'Connor is the Director of Research at the Irish Centre for Applied Patient Safety and Stimulation at Galway University Hospital and NUI Galway. Paul has worked at NUI Galway for the last three years where he's a lecturer in primary care. Paul holds a PhD in psychology from Aberdeen University in Scotland and has over 12 years experience in developing, delivering and evaluating training designed to improve human performance in high risk environments, including nuclear power and the military and more recently in healthcare in the UK, the US and Ireland. So thanks again, Paul, and I look forward to hearing your webinar. OK, thanks a lot, Nikita. So I'm going to talk a little bit about patient safety in primary care. I'm going to do a kind of brief enough introduction, and then what I'm really going to focus in is on one specific um, project that we've just finished. So I thought maybe that can kind of give an idea of what we're doing, where we're coming from, perhaps, and uh, maybe what the future is. So like Nikita said, I'm a human factor psychologist, so my background is on uh, looking at human performance in high-risk work environments. So I did my PhD in Aberdeen in the oil industry, and then I uh, joined the US Navy over the internet, pretty much. And I found myself looking at similar issues with SEALs, with pilots, with divers. Uh, and then I came to, uh, came to Ireland, I started off, I suppose, in secondary care, and then I moved into primary care, although I still do uh, secondary care work. But all of this is focused on looking at performance, looking at safety, looking at how we manage safety and look at how we can manage it better, I suppose. So I and many other psychologists take a kind of organizational approach to looking at safety and managing risk and safety. So in healthcare, we start with, with the patient at the center. And that patient via you, via the healthcare professionals, uh, interfaces with the work environment and with the equipment. So... Um, uh, we, I have a PhD student looking at, at safety in, in, in primary care, and it's one of the things she's found, for example, we got GPs to talk about um, something that, that went wrong in, their, in the delivery of care, where a patient care was compromised. And some of the, the work environment things we found was things like people grabbing the wrong, the wrong drug and, and injecting it because it was stored next to some other drugs. So the work environment is, kind of, is, is, not, is not helping out here. Then we go up a step and we look at, at the individual, uh, and that, again, might be how you interact with the work environment, so how you interact with the computer systems, how the tests and how you get test results, they can also be error-provoking. And all of this is, it also includes what you know, uh, how many hours you work, levels of stress, and all of that impacts the, the, what the, the, the care that you give to your patients. Then we go up, so you're part of a team, um, depends how you want to define that team, but I guess you have a practice team. But also, depending on what and how you think, you're probably including secondary care, you're including pharmacy, you're including all of these other people that interface with you. So that team has to perform in terms of how you communicate and share information. Work in a practice with a manager, you have um, principal GPs, so they set the climate for how you, your, 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 your practice works. That also impacts performance and impact safety. And then the big thing here at the top is the, the society, the culture, the regulator, and how they influence performance. So I know there are lots of people who are looking at safety and performance maybe in, in one specific area like prescribing, but we would take that and you, could, you can look at that throughout the entire um, socio-technological system in which healthcare is delivered uh, in Ireland or, or in the world. So that's kind of the context of, of where I come from or where my research comes from. So patient safety in primary care. So there's been an increasing focus on patient safety in healthcare more generally uh, in maybe the last decade, maybe more than that, depends what, where you, what you consider. But most, almost 90% of the work, maybe more, is focused on secondary care. And we found that adverse events rates in secondary are about 10% o overall. We finished a study in Ireland, we found it was about 12%. And uh, it's about 2 to 3% adverse event rate in primary care. So it's, for, it's much lower in primary care. The risks are lower in primary care. However, most care happens in a primary care setting. So 85% of interactions between patients and doctors occurs in a primary care setting. And in Ireland, there are 24 million consultations in, in general practice within, in, in annually. So although the raw numbers are very small in terms of percentage, that, that's quite a lot of error that's, that's probably occurring. Although we don't really know how, how much. 
And so the argument for this is we need an increased focus on patient safety in, in a primary care setting. So the work we're doing here, we actually do patient safety work across healthcare. So Kira Kern, who's a, a GP, she's looking at patient safety from the GP's perspective. We have a, a PhD student who's looking at the patient's perspective of safety in primary care, which we don't know yet. It may be the same, it may be different. Not quite sure what the value added is for the patient's perspective, and I guess we'll see. Uh, we have a new PhD student who's looking at um, patient complaints about community care in terms of uh, what they are, what the risk is, and where they're coming from. We have uh, another PhD student looking at accessing healthcare for people with autism. Um, we're looking at patient complaints. This is an HTC project, also in, um, also looking at patient complaints, but this case, this time in acute care, which may or may not be the same or different from community care. We have a project looking at hand hygiene in the ICU, and uh, I'm a co-director of a master's program called Healthcare Simulation Patient Safety. And we have maybe 10 to 12 uh, students a year who look at some aspect of safety, mostly in secondary care, I think, because it's simulation. We get secondary care doctors and nurses, and they're looking at things like um, particular procedures and how dangerous they are, how safe they are, and how they can become safer. And we have a new PhD student looking at safety in the ambulance service. So, but again, going back to the previous slide, all of this work is centered around this kind of socio-technological systems approach to, to managing safety and, and improving safety. So I've given you kind of a big overview, and I thought that the easiest way to maybe get into this was to present a particular study, a feasibility study that was funded by the HRB, and all these people worked on it with me, and we've just, we've just wrapped it up, and I believe it's accepted for publication now. And uh, so I'll just talk about this, and then we can get an idea of the kind of things you can do to improve safety in a, in a primary care setting. So the big background is GPs, and not just GPs actually, doctors generally report difficulty on knowing how to improve safety in their practice. So if we say you need to improve safety, but, but how do they do it and where do they start? And that was kind of the degenesis, I suppose, of this project. And a feasibility study, so this is like a small study. So whether it's a feasibility or pilot study, there's some debate about the terminology, but basically what we try to do is so instead of going straight to a randomized control study, we're doing this feasibility study to decide whether or not our proposed intervention is worth running as a randomized control trial. So it's like a kind of small randomized control trial. So what we did was we recruited uh, nine practices from the Republic and two practices from Northern Ireland, and we tried to get a spread of large and small and urban and rural and uh, one of the big differences from randomized controlled trial is, you know, we, we, don't ha we don't have the numbers here, so we're, we're looking at different things. But anyway, we got our guys, and we, um, we divided them into intervention and control, and one of our intervention practices dropped out, which I'll talk about later. So quite a small study, just to see if what we're doing works. So this was a nine-month intervention. It was very much based on what they've been doing in Scotland, what uh, Paul Bowie and others have been doing in Scotland in terms of their own uh, their patient safety program. So we borrowed their safety climate survey, and we borrowed their patient record review uh, method. And that was our intervention. So you do a survey on safety, and, you get, and we give you some feedback about uh, what the people in your practice are saying. This is anonymous. And then we also got a doctor in the practice to review some of their records to look and see if errors were occurring, and if so, what they were, and how they could be, um, they could be addressed. And I'll, I'll discuss this in a bit more detail later. So this is the survey, it's a safe quest, and it's uh, a short survey that looks at safety in a primary care setting. And unlike a lot of safety climate questionnaires or safety culture questionnaires, this one was designed specifically um, for primary care, so they didn't adapt to hospital one, but this is derived from safety issues within primary care. So they looked at workload, communication, leadership, teamwork, and safety systems, so sort of how you manage safety uh, in the practice. Now the trigger tool chart review, this is, a, what you have is you, you pull 25 records from a, a high-risk patient group, so patients over 75 years, for example, and then you look for specific triggers, so frequency of consultations, if there's been some change to the medication, or uh, if they visited the ED. And if some of these triggers 
flag, then you go in and you look and you look in more detail to see if there are any uh, errors made in the care. So it means it's kind of quick. So maybe four hours to do 25 patient records maximum, I think. And uh, you only look at, you only go into the detail of the chart if, and if, if uh, one of these triggers triggers. And so it's not, it's not a bad, it's not a bad way. It's a relatively efficient way of, of looking for where you can improve safety. Then if harm was, was found to occur, we get the doctor to classify the severity and identify a possible action for how they're going to address this, this harm to prevent it from happening in the future. So it's kind of a leading, you're, you're uncovering things you might not know about otherwise. So what we were interested for this pilot study was we wanted to know whether people were willing to actually participate in this study at all. Uh, you guys are busy, so there's only limited time, so it was possible you may not want to do it. And kind of a line to that was, could we retain control and intervention practices in the study? We wanted to see if people would fill out the questionnaires. Uh, even if the study was involved, it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone in the practice wants to, to participate. And we wanted to get some feedback on whether, the, inter the, whether the, uh, the people participating thought it was feasible and useful and sustainable. And the focus here wasn't just the GPs. We were also interested in feedback from practice nurses and from uh, the receptionists and the other admin people. And then we were going to have a look at the effect of the intervention on safety climate, not from a statistical sense. So we weren't going to do a statistical comparison. We weren't, we weren't powered for that, but we were going to look to see if there was some kind of difference and that we would expect statistical significance. Here's what, what we did. Um, <laughs> there's quite a lot of it, I guess. So we, we recruited people of uh, everyone with two people, to, two uh, practices declined to participate of those we tried to recruit because uh, of, the, of, the, of the time that was taken to participate. Then we allocated everyone to uh, intervention and control and the, the control get nothing. And then we measure their safety climate at the end. So if you were in the intervention practice, you did a safety climate questionnaire. So everyone, fed, um, everyone got feedback from their safety climate questionnaire. So everyone in the practice does it. We would write a short report about what we found. And then we would go into the practice and talk about it as well. And the idea here was to kickstart. The idea was to get the practice to kind of drive the specific intervention. We were providing the, uh, the information, but we don't know the specific pro issues within that practice or even what's feasible. So uh, it was up to the practice to decide what to do. Then someone in the practice did a trigger tool chart audit, which again gives information about where issues might be, say, for example, uh, around warfarin management. Do the survey again. We would come in, give them feedback again. They do the trigger tool chart audit again. They may identify other issues. And then basically they're, they're finished. And so the, the reason I have those boxes in red, well, these are the ones we were looking at for the purpose of did our intervention work? So we compared safety climate at the beginning and the end, and we did some interviews and surveys with the intervention guys about what they thought of our intervention. Um, so altogether, they reviewed 188 charts and 150 led to triggers. So these are 188 charts from patients uh, over 75 years. So they were a high risk group and that was deliberate because we want to define things. Um, and so 150 triggers. And from that, we found 36 patient safety incidents. So it's about 19%. And you can see further down on the side, if you look at the severity, um, maybe eight, eight plus five, so 13. So about the third were relatively severe and uh, they, could have, they could have been prevented. So they, they had to they had origins in primary care, not just, you're not just taking things that had crossed over from, from secondary care. We found our, our recruitment was satisfactory, the response rates to our, to our questionnaires were satisf satisfactory, and our retention rates weren't bad. So one practice withdrew, and the reason that practice uh, withdrew was the doctor that was kind of running the intervention or was driving it there left to go to another practice. And the, the practice didn't want to stay in the, in the trial because of the, of the workload for, of what we were asking. The feedback, they liked it. They thought it was useful. Um, it allowed them, the trigger tool chart in particular they liked because it allowed them, it gave them directions about where, you know, may, where maybe where the risks were for that practice, like the example here in terms of that protocol for managing warfarin. But the main barrier, the big barrier was time. 
I mean, we found that even getting into the practices to have a meeting, so we would try and meet them during their practice meetings, but sometimes they didn't, they had, they had trouble holding them uh, on a regular basis themselves, or maybe everybody couldn't attend. So the big barrier to all of this was time. And uh, I, I understand that. Um, there's not much time, perhaps, for some of what, of what we were doing, and it does take effort if you want to, uh, just to change your protocols, for example. If you look at the safety climate scores across the practices, so this is where they do the, um, they did this, our safety climate survey at the beginning before we did the intervention and at the end. And the grays are the controls pre and post and the blues are our intervention groups. So it's pretty, it's quite positive I think. You can see that um, the grays mostly stayed the same on each of the factors in the questionnaire or maybe got slightly worse and the blues got got slightly better. I mean, we're not look, talking about massive changes here, but maybe there's a, there's a slight change in terms of how uh, safe or people's perceptions of safety in the practice as a result of um, participating in our, in our intervention. So to conclude, I suppose, so I, we believe the intervention with maybe with some caveats is feasible, useful, and sustainable. There's some evidence there of a positive effect of the intervention practices most importantly are willing to be recruited and response rates were acceptable to our to our questionnaires and except for that one um practice they remains in the, for the duration of the trial so we decided that, that there was enough evidence to support a definitive randomized control trial of an intervention and we have submitted that to the hrb uh, one of the big changes we've made is instead of the outcome measure being safety climate which i do accept is kind of a weak um a weak measure of effectiveness, we're going to look at, um, we're going to take a much larger sample of, of patient charts and look and see if there's a change in, in adverse events for, for, the, for the intervention. And we're going to push the intervention up to 12 months. So we'll see what happens. Uh, hopefully they fund it. I'm slightly worried about the new GDPR regulations that we're going to have to deal with in terms of people looking at, at patient charts, but I think we have a plan for that. And we will, uh, we will see what happens. We'll know in December whether or not they're willing to fund this uh, much larger project or not. But definitely, I think there is a lot of scope to examine, improve, support GPs and other members of the primary care team to, uh, to improve patient safety in their practice. And that's uh, the end of my talk. I was quite sure how, to, how long to make this, but anyway, that's it. That's all I have to say. Um, if there's any questions, I'll be delighted to, to take them.